So thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Modell with Stonehenge Capital. Um, you can tell here we, uh, we selected the name Stonehenge because Stonehenge has been out on the Salisbury Plain for close to 4,000 years. And you know we tend to focus on uh, technology-enabled investments. And Stonehenge was such an innovative uh, technological uh, advancement at the time, uh, they still don't know exactly why it was built or how it was built. So it goes along with Les's, uh, Les's concept of if you can understand it, it's obsolete. Uh, we still don't understand it, and it still serves as, a, uh, as an inspiration to us. Uh, you'll find that I'm a visual thinker. Um, I, I kind of hate PowerPoint, so I'm really just more going to talk, and um, we'll, we'll go through these slides and talk about the kinds of things that we look for and what we focus on. Uh, what really separates Stonehenge uh, is our mission, um, and it's right here. Stonehenge aims to catalyze the rapid growth of companies in up-and-coming markets by backing passionate entrepreneurs who are solving business problems. Stonehenge is focused on finding investment opportunities in underserved markets, areas where there's an abundance of entrepreneurship and innovation, but a relative shortage of locally available, professionally managed capital. I spend a lot of time in upstate New York. Um, my partner is based down in Tampa. And you can see here that Stonehenge spun out of Bank One back in 1999. Uh, we manage over $600 million of capital that is specifically regionally targeted in eight states with offices in six of those eight states. Uh, the vast majority of that capital is targeted towards later stage lending to manufacturing and distribution companies. I like to say that my later stage colleagues like to lend money to metal benders. Um, what I do, what my partner in Tampa does, is we focus on growth equity stage companies, uh, primarily technology-enabled companies that are going to be applying technology to solve a business problem, focused in the southeast, Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and the northeast, primarily upstate New York, western Pennsylvania, and other areas where there's a wealth of innovation, but yet a shortage of locally available capital. Um, in addition to the direct investment and the regionally focused funds that we operate, Stonehenge is also the nation's largest um, tax credit allocatee for new markets tax credits. We have about $600 million that, we, uh, that our new markets tax credit group manages uh, targeting community development opportunities in underserved markets. We do that in partnership with the National Urban League. And we also operate um, another group of tax credit uh, services focused around entertainment finance. Uh, we do have, we have looked at green energy uh, tax credits before. I believe there's a program in North Carolina and, and a few other states. Really what's most important here, uh, aside from all the different tentacles that Stonehenge has into our communities, is that we really have been successful by building relationships, excuse me, by building relationships and becoming partners in the communities in which we operate. Uh, I'm currently vice president of the Upstate Venture Association of New York, known as Uvani. Uh, next year, I'm likely to be president. Uh, my partner is president or former president of the Florida Venture Forum. And we find that by becoming part of the community, instead of just the guy from the city with the money, by becoming part of the community, building the trusted relationships with groups like ICANN, with organizations like the Upstate Venture Association, it really allows you to build trust, get to know the people in the community, see the right opportunities when other people aren't looking for them. And that's really what's been uh, unique about us. One of the things that I'm going to talk about with you guys today is um, how do you make sure that you, as an entrepreneur, and your companies are good matches for securing private investment, uh, typically venture capital investment? And what are some of the characteristics of your company that are going to make it uh, most likely for you to achieve success raising that capital because we know how difficult that is? One of the things I always like to start with is why entrepreneurship? Uh, why, why do people go out and create businesses? Is it because they want to be famous? Is it because you want to be the king, you want to be the boss of your, of your own company, have all the power? Or is it because you want to be rich? Or is it because, where did it go here? Or is it because you want to change the world? All of those, of course, are valid reasons. Um, entrepreneurship is the key to economic development, key to the growth of our communities. The U.S. has been a leader in innovation, in commercializing innovation, creating jobs and building our economy. Uh, and that's something that we think is very important. One of the things that uh, is very interesting to me is that venture-backed companies 
represent 11% of the total jobs in the United States. All this data that I have is United States data that's been provided by the National Venture Capital Association available on their website. I've provided the link as well. These 11% uh, shows a growth in venture-backed jobs over the last 10 years, and even in the economic downturn of the last few years, that number has remained constant. When you think of the companies uh, and the industries that are leading innovation and leading economic growth over the last 10 years and into the future as we continue the recovery, areas like software, biotechnology, semiconductors, computers, and telecom are very highly, the number of jobs in those industries are very, very highly concentrated into venture-backed companies. And even though venture-backed companies represent a total of 11% of all jobs in the United States, they represent over 20% of revenue, over $3 trillion in revenue in 2010, comes out of the companies that are venture-backed. Also, because a lot of those are technology companies, uh, it's probably reasonable to assume that the margins are higher than a lot of industrial manufacturing companies. So while venture-backed companies represent 20%, of revenue generated in the United States, it's probably significantly more than that in terms of earnings. So this is all very good work. And this is one of my favorite pictures because it's very important for you to go out and create your business and get started. Have an idea, see if it works. If it works, go raise some money. If it doesn't work, go back and have another idea. There are a lot of organizations that can help you get your company started and get off the ground. Uh, this is a list of some of the companies that are here in New York. Some of them are regionally focused, like the, uh, some of the regional accelerators and incubators or the Council for Economic Growth. Some of them are also industry focused, like there's a MedTech group, there's the iClean that's focused on clean technologies. And these are companies and uh, organizations that you can go to for support as you're getting your company started. But how will I finance it? Um, I think this is very important. It's important that everybody understands, um, and I did not write this quote, but I think it says it very well. Making investments at the earliest stages of a company's development involves extraordinary risk. Young companies, which you all know, have little or no collateral to secure bank loans, no assets or track records to attract financing from private equity firms, and no opportunities for short-term gain to interest hedge funds. So venture capitalists step in and assume this risk by providing capital. But one of the things that's important here is the risk that's there. There's a lot of failure in a lot of early stage companies. A lot of people have to go back and change their ideas. And venture capitalists think very often about they need to invest in companies that have the opportunity to generate enough success to make up for the failures in their portfolio. So a rule of thumb is that most venture capital investors will look to return three to five times their invested capital in a, any given company over a four to seven year period. Um, oftentimes, you'll hear venture capitalists say that they can't look at the opportunity to invest in your company unless there's a chance that they can earn at least 10 times, because there have to be some 10 times in a typical venture portfolio in order to make up for the inevitable zeros. Um, on average, the very top venture capital firms will typically only return two to three times their entire fund, um, and those are considered the best in the business, and part of the way they do that is by managing the risk. Before we talk a little bit more about how to finance the company itself, I want to take a detour. Uh, this one, this one I bet it's, oh, where'd it go? This one I bet is a slide you never thought you'd see in a finance presentation. Um, I think it's very important to talk about, is venture capital right for my business? Um, a venture capital investment is a partnership. It's a partnership between you and your investor, like it or not. Um, you're gonna be working with these people as your board members, as your advisors typically for four to seven years. You're gonna be taking a lot of advice, some happy, some more challenging. And it's gonna be very important to make sure that you find the right investor and make sure that you're the type of entrepreneur that is a good match for this kind of relationship. And it's important that you find the right investor who's gonna be aligned with your goals. I started a few minutes ago by talking about why you're starting your company. Is it because you wanna be the king? Is it because you wanna be famous? Or is it because you wanna be rich? Let me tell you how your investor sees it. The only thing your investor really cares about at the end of the day is returning capital. Because the way that the private investment model works is that we venture investors only generate uh, returns and generate income for ourselves when we return to our investors more money than we started with. So when an investor 
invest in your company, they typically purchase stock and they realize a profit or a return on that investment when the company is sold or when the stock is repurchased. So it's very important to understand that from day one, when you take money from a private investor, that investor is going to be concerned about, are you growing the company big enough so that one day you'll be selling it or you'll be able to repurchase it to buy our stock back? Um, one thing to think about is if you're starting your company because you want to be the king, um, having somebody looking over your shoulder asking you when the company is going to get to a point where you can sell it may not be the right match for you. The second thing that your investor cares about is time. A uh, typical investment fund is a 10-year vehicle. That means that we're expected to invest the capital and identify the companies during the first five years. And during the second five years, focus on continuing to grow those companies and exit them. Um, especially in the current economic challenges, you know, that exit horizon has even extended. So it's very important to understand that if you are bringing private investors onto your side of the table to go on this journey with you, you're going to have to be prepared to have those conversations about are we growing fast enough, are we maintaining profitability, and are you going to be able to exit at some point to help me get a return on my investment so that way we can move forward. Now that we've covered that, I want to get back on track. You've decided that you're a good match, you're ready to undertake this relationship, and the next thing to think about is, is your company going to be a good match, something that's appetizing for uh, institutional and private investors? Not all companies are venture-backable. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just something important to think about. I had a conversation a year ago or so with somebody um, in our general region here who wanted to start a kayak rental business. He was going to raise money from investors, buy kayaks, and, and rent those kayaks to people who wanted to go on tours up and down the Hudson, which is a great idea. It could allow him to have a nice lifestyle, generate some income for himself. But think about if an investor invested $500,000 in this kayak rental business, is there really any conceivable way that that $500,000, the value of that investment could grow to the two and a half million to $5 million that that investor would be looking for to receive on the other end? Something to think about. The, uh, the entrepreneur in this case is going to have a hard time if he tries to bark up that tree and, and find pro uh, professional investment capital because the return opportunities may not be there. It's a good lifestyle business for him but it's not really a good candidate for venture capital. Investors also like to invest in companies that solve a problem. This is one of my favorite pictures because this is probably about how I would have solved a Rubik's Cube back when I was a kid. Um, I, I wasn't even this smart. I took it apart and figured out how to put it back together. But if your company is figuring out a way to take a very complicated problem and a pain point that is almost universal and a simple way to sell it, that is the best way to find, uh, those are the kinds of companies that investors like to look at. I mean, when I, for, for medical technology investors, they may be looking at companies that are going to be an innovative drug or, a, or, or a, a new device or a therapy. For others, it could be a new way to deliver advertising or make it easier to communicate to people. But by having a problem that you're solving, it makes it much easier to convince to your customers why they want to buy it. It makes it much easier to enroll investors in your vision and, and how they can see the opportunity. It also makes it easier in the longer term to identify who your potential acquirers are going to be. Stonehenge focuses on investing in companies that apply proven technology to solve a business problem. Um, we have a focus currently over the, about half of our portfolio is looking at companies that are addressing the current challenges in delivering health care efficiently and cost effectively. We think that that's an emerging trend that is obviously getting a lot of press today that we think is going to continue over the next investment horizon for our new fund. Um, and we also believe that the greatest value to a community, to a company, um, and to investors is to is when you're applying technology to solve a problem. It's a, it's a, there, there continues to be a lot of opportunity, but yet a lot of risk in taking technology out of a lab. But it's once we can apply uh, investment capital to help sales and marketing and help that product and that solution find an audience, that's really where, uh, where the greatest value is driven. Historically, the most successful venture-backed companies are those that can grow or scale rapidly without repeat large investments. Uh, one of the things that we've seen through the internet revolution is it doesn't take $5 million to start a company today. You can start a company on a shoestring with employees working virtually by hosting everything in the cloud. A lot of that infrastructure um, has gone away. And one of the things that's most interesting to investors 
are companies that can scale without continued, uh, without a lot of significant continued investment. If you look at our kayak rental business, for example, imagine if that entrepreneur had a vision where he could build a website uh, to build an online community focused around river sports. Uh, not only would you be limited to people in the local Hudson Valley, you could target river sports enthusiasts around the world. You could host advertising. You could, you could get companies to sell their product or their tours. There are many other ways where, where that type of business or an entrepreneur focused in that type of area could have looked at a much larger opportunity. Personally, I think there are a whole host of other challenges starting an online community business like that, but I wanted to use that as an example of a business that may be more scalable, may be more interesting to institutional investors. In that case, that wasn't what the entrepreneur had in mind. It wasn't what his vision was, and he's good to go off and do his thing. But I was giving an example of something that may have been more appetizing for a traditional investor. So uh, we're back to this picture again, because one of the most important things to do, finding a private investor, is often like finding a spouse. Uh, you want to know that through the ups and downs uh, and the good times and the bad times, you have a partner on your side of the table. Um, you also need to find an investor who wants to do what you want to do. There are some investors who are understanding uh, and willing to invest in pre-revenue companies where a lot of the technology risk is still on the table. There are some investors who are willing to, to invest in companies that are going to need $50 million to get a drug in development through the FDA process. Stonehenge is not one of those companies. But it's important to understand who, who that potential investor is. I always recommend that even before you start your company, you should be asking the question, am I an entrepreneur who really wants to take this kind of capital? Is my company the kind of company that could be appetizing for an investor? Uh, based on some of the things we've talked about, and who are those potential investors? I can't imagine a worse fate than an entrepreneur spending a lot of time building a company and expecting to go out and raise capital and finding that, that what they're doing is not a match for the capital that's out there. If you ask some of those questions, you can take some of that startup risk yourself off the table by building something that you can easily identify your customers and identify who your potential investors are. So once you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to think that your company is venture backable, you're ready to go out and get some money. And you automatically run into a wall because there is a very huge gap uh, right where you need it most. Um, we've talked about some of the early, um, early sources that can help you get the advice to get your company started. They're um, in the seed and early, early, early stage rounds when you're finishing your product development and doing a lot of the commercialization and and development of the initial product. You can go to groups for SBIR grants or nice CERTA for some early stage grants or academic institutions for some opportunities to do that. Then you go and look at your friends and family and individual angels and angel groups even today as they are working more closely together are looking more often for companies that have a finished product already. And a lot of these local groups, a lot of these regional networks can help you get to a million dollars in revenue. But there still remains a large gap because a lot of larger uh, venture firms are focused on writing five to ten million dollar investment amounts in companies that are already at five million dollars of revenue. I mean it's important to think about how can you scale your company to get through that gap, particularly in areas that are outside the beaten path of New York City, Boston, or Silicon Valley where there isn't a lot of readily available professional capital. One of the things that we focus on um, in this stage are the technology risk. I call that the will it work risk. Um, and the second risk is market adoption risk. Is you know, Can you convince somebody to pay money for your product? Do you really solve the problem? I um, mean, those are some of the things that are really important in here, and those are the things that will help you uh, get over the gap. In fact, early stage funding has always been challenging to get, but you can see in this chart from 2000, it dipped to almost 5% of total invested capital was in the seed and early stage rounds. It's rebounded a little bit. Uh, to just over 12% or 10% today, um, I would argue that a lot of that capital going to very early stage companies is still chasing after, you know, me too, photo sharing, social media type apps, a lot of what you see in Silicon Valley in New York. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for companies that are really solving business problems um, and that have a real refinable uh, return on investment for customers and investors, but it's very, very hard for those companies to, to, to uh, to attract capital at the earliest stages. 
These are some of the groups that are doing that. I mentioned when we started that I'm vice president of the Upstate Venture Association of New York. It's really our mission to, to continue education and help entrepreneurs get on the right path when they're starting their companies, help make introductions to capital, and bring capital providers and entrepreneurs around the table at the same time across upstate New York. Uh, the other groups that are doing incubation, acceleration, um, early stage funding, uh, forums where you can go and, and show your company, there are a lot of them in our region. For those of you uh, watching us online, I'm sure there are plenty in your regions as well. So where does Stonehenge Growth Equity fit into this picture? Uh, the vast majority of what Stonehenge does is we focus on growth equity stage companies. And we, uh, you can see the chart there, we, we define growth equity stage companies as companies that are past the traditional early stage risks of does the product work and is somebody willing to pay for it. Uh, the majority of the companies that we invest in are at uh, they're at two to ten million dollars in revenue. Um, often we have invested in companies that are earlier than that, but they're always, you know, more than zero revenue because the most valuable due diligence point for us is to be able to call customers and say, does it say what you think it's going to say? Does it solve the problem that you expected to solve? And is it worth more or less than what you're paying for it? The second thing is that um, we think that it's very important with the capital that you raise to look at profitability. Um, I know a lot of focus on on uh, venture type earlier stage companies is rapid growth, rapid growth, and rapid growth. But we think very importantly when you're in an area like upstate New York or western Pennsylvania or other areas around the country where there's not a lot of readily available local capital, the single best thing that you can do to make your company appetizing is to prove that there's a growth opportunity by, by generating revenue, but also prove that you can use your capital because the worst thing that you want to do is burn through your first round of financing and be in an area where finding that second round of financing is really challenging. Focusing on profitability, focusing on being efficient with your sales process is a way to allow yourself to control your own destiny. The second thing that we do is in addition to our growth equity investing, we, uh, we also, Stonehenge was recently awarded $5 million from Empire State Development's Innovate New York program. This is a program targeting seed stage and early stage investments. This $5 million allocation will require a matching amount. Um, so what we're looking at is we're looking to deploy this capital into companies that are in th at the intersection of healthcare and IT. We've looked at companies, we have investments in companies that are applying software and services to the clinical trials process to make it more efficient. We're invested in companies that are focused on electronic medical record management. How do you get records back and forth? How do you manage care of family members who are far away? Um, we typically like to invest in these companies. Even though they're at the seed stage, we want to make sure that there are at least initial indications of customers. Can we call somebody who says that they're using it? Um, can we do that? Does the product work? And is, it can, is the solution going to be adopted? Take some of those risks away. We aim to make a million, $1 million investment in these companies. About half of that would be out of the Innovate New York pool. The other half would be out of Stonehenge's other fund. Um, what will we not do? We will not invest in drug discovery therapeutic companies that typically require many millions of dollars to get to revenue generation. Uh, same thing with medical devices. The regulatory risk and the capital requirements are challenging for a fund of our size. I, mean, we all, I always say that we don't, we don't invest in science projects. Uh, we, we, we really are looking to invest in companies that have a product, that have a technology that has been validated that is being used to solve a business problem. Um, to date, since 1999, my partner in Tampa and myself have invested about $45 million in 29 companies. Um, about 12 of those companies are in New York State. Seven of those 12 companies are headquartered in upstate New York or have significant presence in upstate New York. We're currently in the process of raising $100 million, including this Innovate New York money to continue building on this platform. So we're very interested today in talking to uh, companies and looking for opportunities. We, um, we're, uh, we're targeting uh, additional investments to, to be looking for new companies to invest in towards the end of the year. Uh, one of the things that's important working in these underserved markets is we know that it's all about relationships. Um, we spend a lot of time working with our CEOs, working with our management teams, and working with others in the community to build trusted relationships. Uh, when you have trust, even if we're not the largest investor in the company, 
Um, very often our CEOs will call us and say, hey, Brian, I've got a board meeting on Tuesday, and I know that John is going to react this way. How do you think I should handle it? Working with, your, with, the, with the rest of the board and with the management teams as a partner, as a collaborator, not a dictator. There are things that are important to us, like financial controls and you know pipeline reports, but it's also important that you build them in a way that builds trust. And the most thing that I'm most proud of is the last three portfolio companies that we've invested in in New York have all been companies that we were introduced to by referrals from our CEOs. People who say, hey, if you're looking for money and want a good partner, you've got to call the guys at Stonehenge. And that's to me, that's the best validation. We also bring to the table a deep network of relationships. We have, because Stonehenge has offices in eight states, we have a deep network of co-investors who we can bring to the table. The best way to invest in, to attract capital to your company in upstate New York is to find an investor who can convince people from outside upstate New York to come up. Um, I identified a company in Rochester and introduced a New York City firm who came in and co-invested with us. And the first question they said to me was, am I going to have to go to Rochester to go to board meetings? Um, yes, you can handle it. It's really nice up there. Um, it's very important to have a local partner to help attract the rest of the capital to the community. Um, as I wrap up, I wanted to focus back to, we've talked about, is, are you a good match? Is your company a good match? And I wanted to circle back to, what are some of the things that investors are looking for? Um, you know, I know it's an old platitude, but they say the three most important things uh, in identifying an investment opportunity are management, management, and management. Um, it's kind of like when you're buying real estate, right? The, what's most important, uh, what we focus on are, does management have the, excuse me, do they, uh, can the management enroll others in their vision? It's a, it's a sales process as much as anything. You're selling your customers to buy your product. You're selling your investors to see your opportunity. I think that that's very important. Are you able to sell your business? Are you able to sell your vision? That's going to help you attract customers. It's going to help you attract investors. It's going to help you attract employees. It's going to help you achieve the goals that you set. The second thing that's important to us is, does the management team have relevant domain expertise? Just because you like to play golf doesn't mean that you're the right entrepreneur to turn the golfing industry upside down, right? Do you have, do you have experience? Just like you should be looking for investors who have done something similar to what you set out to do so that way you can increase your chances of success. Um, we look at management teams. Have you, ha have you had experience in the medical records business and therefore you have credibility with us that you're going to be able to solve a problem? Helps understand that you've lived through that problem. The third thing is flexibility. We all know that there's going to be bumps in the road. We all know that your sales cycle is going to take longer than you expected or your customer is not going to react the way that you had thought they were going to react. And working very closely in a collaborative relationship with your board is very important. We want to know from the beginning one of our important due diligence points is understanding what that flexibility is in that relationship because you know that you're not all, plan A is not always going to work, but are you going to be able to shift over to plan B when necessary is very critical. The next thing we talk about, uh, again, this is a repeat slide because it's so important to remember that your company needs to solve a big problem. By being able to articulate what that problem is, is the best way to give customers that aha moment. I've been, I don't know how I ever live without this. I have to pay for it. Um, it also helps you enroll customers. It helps you enroll um, investors. Um, and it makes it easy to think about future acquirers. Remember that from the moment I invest, I'm going to be thinking about who am I going to sell this company to in five years. Um, thinking about how big that problem is also helps you identify who your investors are because you can see what they've done before. It helps you identify who your acquirers are and how you can strategically grow the business over that five-year period to make sure that you're most appetizing at that end point. The next most important thing is generate revenue. Um, I, I know it sounds obvious, but the day you ring the cash register is the day you can prove that I've solved a problem that somebody cares about solving and I've made somebody uh, happy. I've made somebody willing to put money on the line. Um, it proves that the technology is proven in a lot of ways. Even if it's a beta project, it just proves that there's validity there and it means that the company's on the right path. A lot of investors will see revenue generation as a critical gate. We can, you know, a lot of people will say that they won't talk to you until you're generating revenue. Uh, and there's a lot of flavors to revenue, but that's something that's very important. Finally, be passionate, right? Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Um, it comes from having vision, having, having a vision. One of the things I mentioned earlier is are you starting this company to change the world? 
Um, even if your goal, the secret is even if your goal is you're starting your company to get rich, you really have to convince people that you're going to change the world because that's going to get your customers signed up. That's going to help you attract the best people to work with you, and that's going to help you attract um, investors. My, um, my content information is here. Um, I live and work down in New York. Um, I spend a lot of my time uh, upstate and in other areas. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me with your ideas, suggestions, questions, or anything else. I, I appreciate the time today. We've got time for one or two questions, and then Brian will be around if anybody has anything they'd like to say. One question. All right, we've got to identify yourself. And Thank you for the presentation. I'm Harv Hillowitz. I own Arc Business Services. Uh, one of the questions I had was, uh, when you come upon companies uh, looking for investors, obviously they have their own challenges already. Otherwise, they would be where they wanted to be uh, a few years ago. Uh, in terms of the challenge of management, does Stonehenge Group uh, assist in any ways like to uh, help them get a management team going or any, any of those kinds of things aside from just providing financing? One of the biggest risks um, is management risk, and you want to make sure that you have as full a management team as possible. But every company at the stage in which we typically look does have you know, needs in their management team. And we work very closely um, coming out of Bank One and looking at uh, finance the way we do. We do think it's important once a company a, a, a real startup, early stage company doesn't always need a full-time CFO, but we do think having financial controls growing into a CFO is important. We work very closely with our companies to report to recruit team members, I mean, also to recruit board members. I think having having board members that have industry expertise around the table is very important. We go into our network for that. One of the things though, I will say is um, I've seen companies that. Um, it's somebody out of an academic lab who says, I've got this great technology and it's going to work, but I need to hire a CEO to help me run it. That's, that's going to be something that we're not interested in. Um, you know, you need to have a, a driving CEO, often um, somebody who's leading the sales process in the earliest stages to be able to enroll us because those are the people that we're going to back. Over, over 29 companies since 1999, we have never once fired a CEO. Um, and that's something that we're very proud of. We work very closely with our management teams to counsel and coach them. Um, but we, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's Colin Powell's doctrine, right? I don't really want to do a lot of nation building. I want to work with the teams to help them augment, but we don't want to build them from scratch. Brian, we have a question online. Uh, Sarah, you want to address the question? Hi, we have a question from Howard from our online audience. He wants to know, have you made any investments in telemedicine or teleradiology? question was, have you made any investments in telemedicine or teleradiology? Well, thanks a lot for the question. We've looked at some opportunities um, in both of those areas, but we haven't yet. Uh, the closest that we've done is we've invested in a company in Rochester. We have two companies in Rochester, one of which is focused on the um, collection, retrieval, and access of medical records, um, and the other one is focused on applying uh, cardiac safety research through the clinical trials process. Um, there are a few companies that we've looked at in both New York and Florida that are looking at various aspects of telemedicine and radiology, but we have not yet invested in them. I certainly would be willing to look at them. I know you're over here, but uh, thanks for joining. <laughs> Great. Brian will be around uh, for questions anytime afterwards. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. We My pleasure.